Hey, what's good, my brothers? Jujutsu Kaisen Chapter 219 was amazing. I really enjoyed all the content we got this week, and the way Gege delivers these epic moments in such a fascinating way is really cool. This chapter, we got a hand arrow flashback, a domain expansion, Mahoraga, and a very traumatic conclusion. It feels different seeing such power and authority shown in both the past and the present, especially with the flashback. Gege has to give us more of that because it makes the story so much better seeing these legends in their day and age and hopefully we do get more soon but let's just break down this glorious chapter Starting off the chapter, we have finally gotten a glimpse of the Heian era as we see Yorozu's mini flashback and see some events of how she ended up so infatuated with the King of Curses. We begin in the Heian era festival, the Harvest Festival, and this is actually where the Emperor sacrifices or offers things like rice and grain and sake to deities and they pray for a bountiful harvest for the following year. Ryoman Sukuna in the Nihon Shoki legend was known as an enemy to the imperial family. However, he was worshipped in his day as a deity. And in this instance, it seems Sukuna's presence at the Emperor's Harvest Festival was no mere invitation, but it was a sign of goodwill as well. Others must bow and prostrate themselves in front of Sukuna like a god to bless their crops when it's really just so that Sukuna doesn't kill them too, and that is how feared he was in his day. We see there are some grumbling Heian officials and bureaucrats who are disturbed by Sukuna's presence, and they just call him that monster. They explain that the Fujiwara clan's elite sorcerer squads, including the Celestial Squad and the Five Void Generals, fought against Sukuna and teamed up. Imagine that team, some of the best sorcerers in that era, teaming up and still none of them escaped from being torn limb from limb. Sukuna casually bodied the Fujiwara's best and now they seek to get on his good side. From what we understand from Uro Takako, the Celestial Squad captain, she actually got to see Sukuna in his true form and understood that he was the king of curses. And she very well may have witnessed her own squad getting brutally ripped apart by Sukuna. And to this day, she still fears him greatly. I know it may sound like Uro was kind of killed in this battle too, but Uro was actually never given a name and probably forgotten until she was executed as a scapegoat. So we understood Uro was killed by the Fujiwara themselves. But it really puts into perspective how unstoppable Sukuna was. The Fujiwara clan was powerful. Politically, economically, they had military power, and also they had sorcerer power. This is perhaps the most influential clan or family in the Heian era, literally in the emperor's ear or in that inner circle. They married into the imperial family, and they subjugated and possessed many strong sorcerers that were strong enough to dominate Japan and make a name for themselves in this feudal era. Even they had no choice but to basically beg or worship Sukuna so that he doesn't kill them. And this festival took place in the capital of Japan, Heian Kyo, which is now modern day Kyoto. It was known as a peaceful capital, but today we see Yorozu was even given a position in this capital via the Imperial Palace's commission. Yorozu was very wild and barbaric in this time, as you can probably imagine. Hell, she doesn't even wear clothes in this flashback, but in her exploits, she also defeated the five void generals, but the Fujiwara clan gave her this sort of amnesty pardon to work for them. So Yorozu thinks this festival is some type of party where she can just eat sweet offerings and she nonchalantly walks there ignoring her servant and not knowing the due respect demanded for this event. I like how it shows how pampered and exorbitant some people were or how important some of these things are because this is definitely not Yorozu's prime environment. I think it said she was even like this hillbilly from Aizu and this poor little girl has to deal with Yorozu's indecent behavior and shenanigans. And even in this flashback, Yorozu is just so much of a wild card and even an exhibitionist she's just letting it all hang out facing the world and these hand women just these sorcerer women at least they just have no shame and no decency though i'm not mad at it however despite her servants warnings she rushes out 
and we see the king of curses in all of his glory. An amazing full body scene of Sukuna during the Heian era. It looks very menacing and I like how huge and imposing his presence is. It's almost unreal. He even has a cloak that he wears kind of covering his other limbs as he sits. So Yorozu brazenly rushes out, falls in love with Sukuna instantly and embraces her bare naked body onto Sukuna, telling him that it's fine now in a loving way and that he's not alone anymore. And it's crazy how most people are scared out of their minds, scared to death of Sukuna's presence, yet Yorozu actually gets turned on at the sight of such a monster. Of course, Uroume sees this and they are the first to get upset and forced her off of him using their ice curse technique. I actually find this rather funny because Uroume is perhaps the biggest Sukuna fan in history, a simp even, a real simp, right by his side. So now some random naked female hops on Sukuna trying to swoo him Uruume might as well just be saying, get off my man. As if that wasn't enough, Hirozu responds by announcing she will take their place and she'd never let Sukuna have such lonely eyes. I'm sure this is just the first time they've met and Hirozu might not even know who Sukuna is, but she recognized his power instantly and did not want him to feel lonely at the top. If you remember Uro's words, that overwhelming strength that disregards all else, Sukuna is the peak he is the precipice of the jujutsu world and he has no equal nor any lovers or friends to speak of so i guess yorozu wants that loneliness for herself and only she will be that loved one of course she is beyond delirious sukuna will never have such attachments besides maybe uroume and even then it seems uroume is more of like a pet or some subservient to sukuna if anything though i'm sure yorozu would be fine being anything for Sukuna. Hirozu proceeds to get sliced so fast it wasn't even worth Gege drawing her getting cleaved or dismantled. She already was cut while she was giving her monologue and in the next panel she's damn near dead on the ground frothing at the mouth fawning over Sukuna. It's unclear if this is where she died. There were people there ready to help her afterward and I'm sure Sukuna could really just care less if she lived or died. I swear Sukuna he did not move one centimeter. He was like a statue and she was just instantly cut. He was so unbothered by her seduction. It was honestly kind of sad really, but technically Kenjaku knew about her crush and her one-sided relationship with Sukuna. So at one point in time, she actually met with Kenjaku and it's very likely that Kenjaku did the same thing like he did with Kashimo and offered her a second life in the calling games. But now we see her in the present time and we switch over and she states that she is the one who will kill Sukuna. Nonetheless, we are back in the present battle after Yorozu was hit by the massive elephant and her armor broke. She indeed has constructed her quote unquote love and creates a super condensed true perfect sphere made from her liquid metal. A true sphere is a phenomenon that is impossible in reality because a perfectly curved object does not exist in this world. It's only a mere concept in mathematics. So creating this real perfect sphere means that it is impossible to touch as any point on the surface area on the sphere would exert an infinite amount of pressure on anything it touches. So if it touched anything in reality that is not a perfectly curved object, which is basically everything in this world, then the result is a large ball that erases the environment around it infinitesimally. Its definition is kind of hard for me to explain as it's not something that really exists, but it completely erases everything that it touches. I like to think of it as like the stand from Joe Jojo's Bizarre Adventures called Cream, used by Vanilla Ice. It's a sphere that eradicates everything that it comes into contact with. Hirozu then combos this sphere in conjunction with deploying a domain expansion named Threefold Suffering or Three Layers of Affliction. She uses a hand seal of the Mudlahara Mudra. The Mudlahara Mudra is a root teaching representing instinct, survival, and potentiality. And her domain expansion could be referencing the three types of suffering, like with the mind, body, and spirit, 
as it is somewhat existential. Yorozu has deployed her unique domain expansion and it honestly looks like it's checkmate. Even she wonders why Sukuna of all people hasn't expanded his own domain. Sukuna gestures at his Dharma Chakra wheel and it's spinning. If you dwell on Yorozu's actual domain sure hit effect, it is pretty freaking broken. Her sure kill technique is really sure kill. The technique is the true sphere and once it touches you, you'll disappear and die. That's it. Hirozu is just bamboozled as to why Sukuna is just okay with this, but once again, Sukuna proves why he is just better. He summons the Shikigami Mahoraga itself. He uses the shadow ability to slip his Dharma wheel through the domain. Like what really is happening right now? Then Maharaga with the adapted ability uploaded into the wheel proceeds to destroy the domain expansion barrier, freeing Sukuna. This is broken on so many levels. First off, Sukuna explains that Irozu's inefficient use of cursed energy created a major flaw where her application of the technique became repetitive. So no matter what she creates, it's always going to go back to her roots or what she's comfortable with, like creating that liquid metal or just apply to that insect armor. And Sukuna was familiar with that and he has already adapted to all of those abilities. Another thing is, while in domain expansion, it's stated in chapter 82 that domains neutralize all curse techniques. Without a domain countermeasure, an opponent would surely die, especially in Yorozu's. But 10 shadows and that divine wheel said, F that, F the rules. He even made a shadow portal leading to the outside of the domain expansion, which is theoretically impossible because the domain exists in a different space than the outside world. So all of this has to do with the wheel over Sukuna's head. And Sukuna was attacked by this insect armor and technically experienced Yorozu's liquid metal and the nature of her curse technique. So he adapted to it, but he also passed on that adaptation to Maharaga when he transferred that wheel. So in turn, I'd assume he's a to the domain's effect as long as it's the same nature of the curse technique and Maharaga was able to adapt to the nature of her repetitive ability and break the true sphere which by the way is also impossible by normal standards not to mention the barrier itself was true sphere on top of all this crazy maharaga seems to be tamed and it's as strong as ever it may even have gotten some sort of stronger amp because of having sakuna's cursed energy but it was already stronger than even most top tiers already like how much stronger are you gonna make it it does actually look like it's missing its charmed necklace nor did sakuna use the hand seal when he summoned it i don't know if that's a sign that it's tamed but it towers over a weakened Yorozu. I imagine after exerting all of that effort with an inefficient technique and use of cursed energy, she's getting jumped and bodied by the gauntlet of Shikigami and exerting herself, not only performing true sphere as a technique, but also using a domain expansion, draining all of that energy, and now she can't even use her technique. Not that it helped because Maharaga already adapted to it. Yeah, she's she's done, she's cooked, she, it's, it's over and Maharaga wasted no time in slicing her down. Yorozu was delusional. She said she'd kill him, she couldn't even mid-diff him. And even on her deathbed, she took Sukuna's adaptation as a way that Sukuna got to know her well. Truly one of the females of all time, but for real, Yorozu was fun. I know a lot of people don't vibe with her or maybe didn't like this segment or maybe glad it's over, but she was fun and a pretty good example of how strong and crazy Hei and Era fighters were. Plus, we got a cool flashback with her. And in her final moments, Yorozu does leave something for Sukuna as a gift. And this is the same effect that Mai Zenin did in her dying moments in chapter 149. So it's more than likely some kind of cursed tool or weapon for Sukuna to use, and she is imbuing her will or her soul into it. Given her last and final words, it's probably something that Sukuna can use and that he will use it well. It's just weird, like imagine dying to Sukuna and instead of cursing him like a normal sorcerer would, you give him a gift and he 100% does not deserve that gift. He probably won't remember you and he just takes it without appreciation. Now that is really tragic with Yorozu and of all people, Sumiki just had to be stuck with a psychotic, Yandere exhibitionist with a death wish incarnated into her and now she's dead. As a result of her death, Megumi has sunk to the bottom of this darkness inside of Sukuna 
and he has lost everything, including his own will to live. For the first time, we see Megumi with tears in his eyes, crying over his sister's death, and there is nothing he could do. No doubt, he feels like this death is on him, and that hits pretty hard considering he really loves Sumiki, and he has this very profound soft spot for Sumiki. She is his light, she is his compass, and now what does he have i always imagine him and sumiki would at least have some sort of closure in the end of their relationship but her life ended in such a tragic manner and she had no control over it i feel seeing megumi like this at his at literal rock bottom his lowest point in life probably means that he will eventually come back stronger and eventually come back into the story but it's just tough seeing him at his lowest from here i feel the next chapter we will conclude with the events with sakuna possibly in answer to what gift irozu left him or how megumi is doing in the abyss and then we will swing back to the main cast with yuji and everyone trying to plan out their next move if you think about the situation now, Sumiki died, Megumi's in the gutter, Sukuna's unstoppable, Kenjaku has Tengen about to unleash chaos. They need a miracle right now. I honestly hope Angel is still alive in some capacity so she can free Gojo, but more realistically, I imagine them forming new alliances with incarnates and targeting specific people like Kenjaku or even Kashimo getting Sukuna or at least stalling someone in some way. Even getting help from returning characters like the Kyoto students and others like Miwa, Toto, Inumaki, the Jujutsu teachers. It's just been a while since we saw them at least referenced, but let me know what you brothers think in the comments below. I am very excited to see what's next, but this has been Enemy Stand User, and I'll see you awesome guys in the next one. Bye bye